recognize the peoples upon whose land the university now sits um, and others across the state of Connecticut, which includes the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Nipmunk, uh, Nipmuc, excuse me, Scotticoke, Golden Hill, Pogasset, Niantic, Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking people. This talk is aligned with the current heroinity exhibit, which examines and displays art, which can at times be provocative and controversial. It expresses views that sometimes are considered socially taboo. But as we know, it is often art and artists and writers who fuel social change uh, by changing how the story is told. And that's one of the things we're focusing on today. We are also going to um, align this with the call for social examining, social justice and cultural equity initiatives that really can be enacted across a wide, array, a wide array of social, cultural and economic terrains. We are looking at the impact of the educational systems on cultural survival by writing back in indigenous ways of knowing that sustain community life including relationships to ancestors and land that are central to self-determination, restorative justice, and healing. The intellectual and creative labor of Native Americans has historically been the object of collecting. Others speak about and for them, while representations are often negative or antiquated. So Beth Regan's work has involved more than just inserting Information, it really means breaking the cycle of misinformation, one-sided narratives and antiquated notions. When I was discussing with Beth earlier the topics for today, it was clear that a key component or theme was making things visible, which for centuries has been eviscerated or deemed irrelevant. So with that preamble, I would like to, I'm happy to introduce Beth Regan, Morning Deer, member of the Mohegan Tribal Council of Elders. Beth holds a BS in history and education and a master's in human relations from Eastern. She taught at Holland High School uh, for 35 years. She specialized and created the curriculum and lessons on Mohegan history and culture for Connecticut teachers of all grade levels to incorporate into their courses. I have to say that I just get a quick look for statistics and 90% um, of school age Indian children are attending public schools. Right, right. She also uh, has spent over 30 years as a coach and volunteer for Special Olympics. She is a member of the Athletic Hall of Fame at Eastern. She has been the teacher of the year. She's been the coach of the year um, and you know, quite, quite an accomplished person we have with us today. Um, she and I, when we were talking about um, today and contextualizing her work, we did decide to focus on two topics which, which actually overlap, really two segments. And so um, I'm, again, she's going to address one and then address the other. The first one is going to be focusing on uh, the story that is being told, what is worth telling and commemorating, which narratives count as useful and important today. And the other is really um, looking at uh, social justice activism and basically how this knowledge has in both historically and, and today translates um, into some kind of action. And um, she's going to be focusing on two uh, Mohegan activists. And so, um, and also talking about her personal journey throughout all of this. So I'm going to stop there and hand it to um, Beth, Morning Dear, to take it from there. Ah, Mary, thank you. Katapton to mouse chachashayamon, kanatia wish on pawe nayach, wuchi mahiganax. Katapton to mouse, we kwomen, we kwomen. Welcome, welcome. I said thank you to Mary, and I said thank you to all of you, all our relations, all my relations, because that's really uh, the perspective that I come from, uh, that we are all on this circle together and, and we're all family. Uh, not only us as people, but our the animals, the earth, mother earth, the trees, the living, all of it. Uh, we are all on this circle of life. So I, I love to say and thank you. 
in our language. I thank you for that land acknowledgement statement as well. That that means a lot. Uh, and you're right, Mary. We're going to focus on those those things. And I hope um, I may go off a little bit into into. They're probably going to be all related. And I welcome questions and and all. And I'm going to share my screen only because I think it might elicit some questions and some visuals that might help us. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And um, have you? Let's see. We'll start. And just. Um, uh, just put that up there because you've already done, but I did put this slide about identity because we were talking about one's perspective and 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 who gets to speak and and, and you mentioned that as well. But I also wanted to put up there a uh, retired public school teacher uh, and, and those were my two areas of specialty. I did teach American history and world history and 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 that was part of my inspiration like what's American history really okay and what's this curriculum I'm teaching and why is it, where are the voices and and even i mean i remember when i taught world history it's like really this is world history it sounds like european history to me you know um and 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 also i do like to do that i also like to say that i volunteer because i'm a proud member uh i'm a proud graduate of, of eastern and i still volunteer there today I'm, I'm glad to say i volunteer with the women's basketball program because i was an athlete at eastern a student athlete and i still volunteer there today and i'm grateful for that opportunity so i wanted to give that as a shout out but i always and i must first thank my ancestors because without them i wouldn't be here today and their voices uh is it's my job and my purpose to try to carry their voices forward and to show how important they were, which is why I wanted to show you when I wear my regalia, and that's why I have that photo there, it is to honor those that come before me, to, to let their, their culture, my culture come through. And I also want to say that I can only speak for me. I am one voice. I cannot speak for our Council of Elders. Uh, I cannot speak for the Mohegan tribe. I cannot speak for all former educators. How can one person do that, right? You just can't, okay? So every when I speak today, it is from my personal experience, what I have experienced and what I have tried to do. Um, you may get very different perspectives from other native people on the same things. Clearly we know that one voice uh, cannot speak for all, but I'm honored to, to represent the BIPOC community. And, and I, that's where I really feel that, that we need to have our voice. So I always like to start with that um, and, and that. So, so why? You know, we've all seen this before. I, I, I wasn't even gonna share it or we've seen a version of this. So my journey was, well, where are our stories? You know, where are they? What are they? And I think that's also a really good place to start. Don't. I really don't want anyone to assume is that people know and understand their own history, their own even culture. I mean, a culture, native culture, Mohegan culture, who, who has, you know, we're still here, that's the key, but we've had to survive and, and we've lost a lot and regained a lot. I think of our language. I think of our language and how, how it was lost for a long time, but how grateful I am right now that we're able to restore it. We have a language restoration uh, movement right here at Mohegan with the help of other native people, our, a sister tribe, the Wampanoag, and, and which is a sister language. So I'm grateful for that. So clearly it's important to understand that the perspective, uh, the voice that we hear. People will ask me something about my ancestor if I went back and showed you Uncas, our first sachem. You know, he had very, very unusual. Well, you know, what you read about Uncas prior to perhaps maybe a few decades ago or a decade or two ago was written by Europeans, it was written from the perspective of non-Indians and certainly not Uncas, other people's experiences perhaps with him through their view, through their eyes, which is very, very clouded, very, very different. So I just want to be able to, to start with that. And, and so what inspired me? Uh, probably the teachers that came before me that did that, 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 that told that other voice. Okay, or maybe the teachers that came before me that didn't. My educational experience was limited what I learned about Native Americans was probably could fit in a thimble, 
okay, but at the same time was told the first Thanksgiving, for example, where do we get, where do we get our stories from? I mean, the first Thanksgiving, the idea of Columbus, those are all the things we learned in school. And it was clearly not something that, um, that I found to be fair, just, purposeful. You know, I've always thought that I didn't want, you know, I, I understand the halo effect of history and of teaching uh, and of a history book and what you can't fit everything in it. But I also didn't want to have a feel bad history. I, I, what I wanted to do was have open and honest and inclusive history, open, honest and inclusive. And that's why I, I show you this and, and, and you can ask, absent invisible, ask yourself how much you've learned about the people that, uh, the first people of this nation. Ask yourself that. Where have you learned it from? Whose voice have you heard? So, so after teaching for 10, 15 years, teaching American history, I, I, I just, I reached a point where I said, I have to change this. And I did in my classroom. Okay, I certainly did. But I, I have to change this. And I, and I, um, I addressed my administrators and I said, listen, can we, can we start another course? And I want to start a class. I want, and I didn't even know what to call it at first, but I wanted to tell the voice of, of my people, of our people, of native people, of, of the first inhabitants of this land. And, and I didn't even know where to start, to be honest. I just knew that I had to. And it was a journey of many years. It was a journey that my tribe helped me with. Other tribes helped me, okay? And I feel, I feel like I was a teacher even of today. People want to, I think, I have found, I've done a lot of professional development with educators. I have found that they want to teach, I'm using my, uh, where I come from, Native American studies. They want to teach about the American Indian voice. And I'll use that word Indian, and we can ask that question. I'm okay. Again, this is my, where I am, okay? And, um, but they, they didn't know how. How do we do that? You know, who's, how am I going to tell this story? what resources am I going to use? You know, I don't even know where to start. I still had, I did a professional, here's an example. I did a, I, I did a visit to a school a couple years ago and um, it was to a like third grade class. I, I've done all the, <laughs> I used to teach 11th and 12th and then I really had to get used to how do you, how do you teach the little kids too, right? It was just a presentation and st students, were walking in and they were coming in and I wore my regalia because I was going to teach about what that was and you know, on a third and fourth grade level. And students walked in with headbands made out of uh, what you know, paper, construction paper and headbands and feathers. And I'm like, oh my, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And, um, but the, they didn't know better. They didn't know better, right? Their teacher thought that that would be cool to dress like an Indian, right? And have an Indian name. And they all shared their, and, and this was a journey, that was probably one of my biggest challenges. And um, that's why when I show you my regalia, I try to teach them even that word regalia, that this isn't a costume. No one's pretending to be anyone else. This is who we are. So it comes as simple as that. So the absent and invisible voice. So I was grateful that I had the support of our administration, the support of Tolland High School, the support of my tribe. And it took me about three years to start. And I decided to call it Native American Studies because how do you start it, right? Where do you start? And that was my journey. And you can ask me those questions and I, can, I, will, I will address some of that. Okay. And probably one of the first things that I like to start with is something like this. And that's why, Mary, I was grateful to the land acknowledgement statement. I was talking to some students and some teachers and I put this up and I just asked them to take a look. And I asked them, uh, mostly a group of teachers, what they thought, and, and they were sharp, what they thought these X's, why I put these X's on, on here on this particular map. And it was not easy to find a map, but if you, you can probably see some of it and you can see the title at least, okay? I'm not a huge fan uh, of maps that say, you know, the state of Connecticut is clearly 
I would like that maybe to not have the outline state, but it allows us because we obviously we're here before the states, you know, okay, before the colony, but sometimes you have to use what you have, but it, to make my point. And they figured it out. They finally figured out that, oh, wait a minute, that's where my school is, right? Okay. Uh, and they all started looking, what, na what nations were, what, what tribes, what Indian people, you know, you know, were, were, whose land was this that, that our schools were on? And it's a good way to start the conversation. And because um, people do really want to know that I have found. So this was where all the schools were located on Nipmuc land or Mohegan land or Hamanasset, not just the beach, right? Or Quinnipiac, all of that. So to, to, really, to really try to expect that. So what I have learned and one of the things that inspired me was we had to hear another voice. And I know this isn't a talk on education, but I can't separate. If we're going to learn, it starts with education. Right now, before the state of Connecticut, there's a bill to create a Native American curriculum. And um, I'm not sure where the state's gonna go. So are we gonna have this American history, then a Native American history, African American history, and all the, how, how are we going to do this? This is gonna be a really good challenge. I think it's a good start. I think we have to start hearing the other voices. And so what people always ask me is, well, what did you try to do? And um, I went back to my, my culture. <laughs> they come up, these are the, you know, the new phrases. These are not, this isn't even new though in education, but there may be education majors there. There may not be education. I went to obviously to, to Eastern for history and education and then afterwards to move on from that. But, culturally responsive, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to tell our stories. I wanted them to get outside of the classroom, the oral tradition, every culture has a story. What's your story? Everyone that's listening today, what is your story? Who, who, who are you? Embrace it, love it, find your story. So I went to our tribe, I wanted to know my story. And I wanted to bring those stories, find out what your students' stories are. That was easy, bring people in. Bring them in, but really look at the, the get them out of the classroom. To me, I'm get out. We need to go get out of the classroom. And I'm this is just to share. I would have. I love my math counterparts, but you know how much trouble I had trying to get math teachers <laughs> to understand that, or or even bio AP bio. It's okay. They're going to miss a day. I promise they will make it up. But, you know, I, I'll be taking them to a sweat lodge. I'm going to take them to Pine Ridge. I'm going to take them to the Mohegan Reservation. I'm going to take them to see these wonderful, can we, you know, and yes, they're going to miss your class. Oh my goodness. But I promise, I would let them get out of my class. Go, go, go make it up with them now, you know, and people wouldn't go. And how do you teach about the sweat lodge ceremony unless you really go there, unless you really see it. So these are the things, if you can see things that you want to ask, the approach, what approach do we take? you really need to think of a different approach. I taught for 35 years. So my last year I'm thinking, oh, am I teaching 35 more years of history? <laughs> you know, you have to think of another approach. You can't do everything. So I would do a theme approach. I would look at, let's look at ceremonies, native ceremonies. Let's look at native ceremonies from throughout Native America. And that's what I had to decide too, Native America. So am I going to also include the indigenous people of Central America and Southern America? How many days do I have? So I tried to say, I'm going to try to keep it from, that, that would be an area students could go off on, but try to keep it for, uh, let's look at the formation of this nation, pre-contact, post-contact and look at it. And so we would look at a different approach, not only thematically and look at ceremony in different parts of Native America and culture in different parts, but also chronologically and thematically mixed. Let's look at contact. The Mohegan tribe had contact with Europeans in the 1500s. Our Lakota brothers and sisters, perhaps not until the 1800s. How has that experience been similar and how has it been different? As the United States, this country moved from east to west, how did that impact native people? So this, this approach of contact, misunderstandings, tribal crisis, violence, war, removal, reservations, but we are still, as I see, I made a typo here that should see, say, make it relevant. What is going on with today? Cultural resources, resources, the Dakota pipeline, student, we went there. We went to learn. How is that relevant from yesterday to today? 
using the images that are positive, just horrible the way the images, uh, you can see this wall of shame in my classroom. I, I recommended a wall of shame and people would bring up, bring images that we felt were shameful, stereotypical image. And for us, it was with Native America, okay? You can think of some of those images of the so-called first Thanksgiving or Columbus so-called discovering America, all of those things that we would have. So, so I, I thought it was important. Today, we are gonna talk about some Mohegan ancestors of inspiration. But I know, I, I hope I just went really quickly on that, on the voice. But I, I wanna say a dilemma, a dilemma with education. One of my biggest goals is to get more BIPOC people, more people of color, more indigenous people to be educators to teach Native American studies and to be able to be in front of the class and, and have, I am a Native American, to be able to teach it brings an authenticity to this class that cannot be replicated by a non-Native. I don't say that in disrespect. We have to have our non-Native allies. We have, there aren't enough of us, okay? But it is up to us. I spoke to a group of Native educators and that was our theme. It is up to us. Now is our time. We need to bring that voice in. Who else? But there aren't many of us. So the, I still appreciate the fact that I've retired and one of my former students is now teaching that. I taught Russian history. I'm not Russian. Okay. So, and I had to say that. And I had to say, this is going to be interesting. You know, and people always ask me, well, why did you teach Russian history? I said, you know what? We walk, I walked in two worlds. I walk in two worlds. I walk in the world of the past, my ancestors. I do our ceremonies. Okay. I do our traditional ceremonies, but it's 2021. I, I don't live in a wigwam. I walk in two worlds, my past and my present. And I walk in my native and my non native world the native and the non-native. So as a person even teaching Russian history, I had to acknowledge that, I acknowledged that. And I also was a Cold War kid. I had an interest, what, why? The, you know, us versus them, right? I also was a Cold War kid. I wanted to know, I wanted to learn. And I, and let me tell you that journey brought me to a great and deep, profound respect for the Russian people and their history and and I would say Russian what some of the Russian people have because Russia and Soviet are not the same and clearly the Soviet Empire has a very interesting history for, with the American Empire we can make a lot of comparisons from westward migration for the United States and eastward migration for the former Soviet Union so there were a lot of similarities but the respect that I learned for the Russian people and their, what they've endured under governments and of, under political systems is very different. Uh, that's why I wanted to go there and why I wanted to learn. So that's, so I have Mohegan ancestors that inspired me. So I have Samson Occam. We have Occam Hall right at Eastern, right? So we, we will probably talk about that, but I, before we, cause I know we're gonna break for some questions in a little bit. Um, I put myself under Samson Occam because I had to take that journey to where he died. I put myself under Gladys Tentaquidgen because where she went and what she did at Pine Ridge was only one of hers. I wanted to follow in her footsteps and go to Pine Ridge and those are pictures that I can address later. But I would like to see if there were some questions because I just, I just rambled a little about the beginning and the authenticity and what inspired me. You know, what inspires the teacher it, what inspired people to become a teacher is what inspired me to be a teacher, but also to take it a step further. Yes, it's the most rewarding. It's rewarding. I could never, I, you know, that it was the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Being a teacher was the most rewarding for me. I, I loved learning. I wanted to share that passion. I wanted to share that love. I wanted to learn from my students. I wanted to make a difference because the people made a difference to me the people that came before me and I wanted to carry that on. And when that voice wasn't heard, I wanted to bring that voice. My teachers and coaches, because let me tell you, coaches are teachers. The teachers and coaches that inspired me, I wanted to do the very same thing, but I wanted to bring in the voice that wasn't heard. So at this time, Mary, I'd like to pause a little for some questions. I'm happy to go back to other slides to answer questions before we move on to 
ancestors of inspiration? Sure. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, I'm asking that you just type it into the chat and I will uh, address it to um, Beth as you come. So um, from Kathleen, there's a question about um, how do you use geography to oh. teach since you're in a place where Native American names abound in New England? That's a wonderful, wonderful question. Uh, we are more than just the names on the bridges and on the schools. And there's a wonderful book. Um, Mary, you said you were reading it. Were you reading it uh, about um, the lost and found? The oh, I, It slips my mind. The name of the title, Lasting, uh, I'll think of it. But I think geography is very, very critical. The, the concept of place is critical here. Often the map that I refer to, let's go back. I'll also put up a map and I did not, and I can bring it up maybe in a minute. I, I do have another map, a map of the United States. We, we often start that, but we also start with uh, homeland. What is a nation? Because we consider ourselves nations. It's a homeland, this is our homeland. And uh, geography and place is critical. The one thing I think in my experiences, this is my opinion, that native people share. I want people to understand we are unique. Our tribal nations are unique, but we do, I have found we share a few characteristics. And one of them is the reverence for homeland, for this place where our ancestors are buried. This place that we are connected to spiritually, our rivers are alive, the land is alive and it holds the bones of our ancestors. And so when Culturally, when you look at colonization of this continent and the concept that, well, just move, you know, well, why don't you just move west? We're just gonna move the Indians out there, okay? Or move the Mohegans off of their land or fearful. We're lucky we held on to a small part and I can get into that, uh, but uh, was a, a concept foreign to many native people. You know, maybe Europeans felt that, that, well, they came here, so you you can move, right? You can move. Uh, and that was just a foreign concept. So I think understanding and teaching that concept of place and space and who owns the land versus stewards of land, that concept has to be taught very much. Putting up a map of the United States and saying why, and then they'll have nations of the United States, Indian nations of the United States. Really think about what that, that map is saying. Indian nations, look at the state of Connecticut showing Indian trails, village and stations. Really think about what that map is saying. Okay, so I think it's important to understand place. Thank you for that question. Um, I actually have a question for you, Beth, and it, it's um, aligned with what we were talking about the other day. Sure which is how you were able to um, develop the curriculum when you were getting some pushback from the standardized testing. Yes. Uh, yeah. One of the things I think that's really important, I'm gonna go back to, actually I might go forward to that, okay? And one thing that educators, we are forced to test, test, test. I mean. I'm sure many of your students remember all the testing they had to take in high school and before that. And I'm not talking about your final exams and your exams, I'm talking standardized state testing, reading for information, reading for content, science, all of these. So one way that um, I find that I can help educators is to allow them to use sources that can still teach skills. The oral, you can teach reading by using the oral tradition. We can tell that story. I'm gonna tell that story because the oral tradition is more than just a story. It's medicine, it's spiritual, it's it's learning. It It's more than just a story, but you can use a story and it can be written to teach certain skills. And I think that was important when I could teach English teachers when they were gonna to have to make sure their students can read for information, when social studies teachers were gonna to have to make sure they can look at documents and sources. Well, why not use these documents? Why not use this source? And that was a, the, the, the catch. That was the line I could use. And, and I'm honored to say that we used quite a few sources that were native sources uh, that we could use to teach the skills that our students were going to need. And that, that when you can tell administrators that and teachers that, because that's a fear, what am I gonna do? They all have to, pass this test. All right, let's show another way to do it. So you have to be creative like that. That's an important, very important. 
Thank you uh, for asking that. Yeah, thank you. There's also a question from Virginia yeah. um, asking if you've taught outside Connecticut oh. or perhaps out west. That's a great question. I would say that um, every time I'm, uh, I'm a teacher by nat nature, but my professional career, no. I I'm one of those old folks that found the place that I loved and the thing that I loved and I stayed there for 35 years. I stayed in the same school for, from the time I graduated Eastern in 1979. That fall, I had a couple opportunities come to me, a couple teaching jobs and I, the one I chose, I stayed there for 35 plus years and I taught there that changed quite significantly. But today I go, when, when I travel with our tribe and I travel to other nations, tribal nations, I was, I'm was i speaking tribal nations, especially, I might share that, but not formally. Thank you, that's a really good question as well. Uh, there's also one from um, Dr. Barbara Liu. She's, mm -hmm. she's the chair of the English department. Yeah. And she asks, um, are you familiar with the film in the light of reverence. Oh, yes. I shared it with my classes. The students keyed into the ideas about stewardship versus ownership of a land. Beautiful. Uh, very proud of them. Yeah. Yes. And who was that question from, please? Dr. Barbara Liu. She's the chair of the English department. Dr. Barbara, that is fabulous. I love that. And, <laughs> and uh, the concept of one of them that I really, really liked was on Matotipila and uh, to be able to show that land that climbers like, you know, that's not a religion, you know, she knows what I'm talking about. I would recommend that highly are, you know, being marginalized that because, well, they're not in a building. Well, right. We're not. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it, it's a way of life. I, I often say this, it's not a religion as you see it. To me, this is a way of life. My spirituality, spirituality is infused in my whole life. It's not something, please no one take offense. Again, I share this just as my perspective. It's not something I just do when I go into a church or a place of worship, it's something that I live. It's part of who I am, the ceremonial aspect. As a matter of fact, because I've got so lost, I should right now, I didn't do this to start, smudge. It's part of who I am daily. There you go, please. Okay, and my, my team, our team, I'm honored that Coach Beerley at, there at Eastern allows me to volunteer. No, and you know what? I'm, I, I just have to say this, that being able to be who I am with our team is really, really important to teach them, this is who I am, our smudging. This is our medicine wheel teachings. This is, it is part of who we are and, and it is applicable to, to anyone living their life, I think. Not misappropriating, but you know, living their life. So yes, I recommend that highly. My students found that fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, there's um, one more question and then I'm going to ask that we move on to the um, sure. uh, social justice segment. So the question is from Hans. Uh, have you addressed the idea that Native Americans are frozen in time as opposed to evolving like other cultures? Oh my goodness, yes. That is probably my biggest challenge that we are still here that yes, my ancestors lived in wigwams. They were hunters and gatherers, but today Native American people honor that, but we are teachers, we are our, our readers, we are construction workers, we are everyone, we, you know, we are your neighbor, okay? But we are still here. And that is probably one of my greatest challenges. We are all shades of browns. We, are, we have native people that are, uh, have blonde hair. There are native people that have blue eyes. There are native people that have long hair and dark eyes and have, we are not uh, uh, unilaterally the same. We are still here and we are not in the past. We are, we are of our past. We live in our past as we live in our future. I'm not trying to contradict myself. I walk in these worlds, but we are still here. That is fabulous. And you know what? It's, it's ironic that I find that Whenever I work with teachers, especially of younger grades, that's the biggest thing. I'm trying, to, would you please come to my classroom so they could see, please, the, the Native people? And so I did a third grade presentation last week to 80 third graders on Zoom. And I must have said every time, see, we're still here. That was my ancestor. I had to really concentrate on what an ancestor was and, and who we are. So yes, that's a, a really, really um, important concept. I think okay, there is um, there is a shout out from Denise saying <laughs> how much you've taught the players in regards to diversity and inclusion. So with her you. blessing, it doesn't come without her <laughs> blessing. So um, I'm wondering.
wondering if you could move on and discuss a little bit the two yes. uh, social justice activists that you were going to focus on. Okay. I love it. I would love to. Um, you know, I, that's why I put Samson Ockham. I'm wondering uh, if anyone even, if the students that are, might be resident students there lived in Ockham Hall or walked by Ockham Hall and they often wonder what is, what is you know, they probably don't, but that's why, you know, probably a lot of other things to worry about. But that's one of the reasons I chose Samson Ockham and Gladys Tentaquidgen as uh, activists in two different eras who have passed that on to me, okay? Uh, and. Um, that's why I put the photo of myself that went to, because Ockham was uh, buried in New York. And Gladys Tantaquidgen, you see two visuals from Pine Ridge Indian Reservation because I wanted to follow that path and circle that she had created. And I, you see a burned out um, trailer on Pine Ridge. There's a story that goes with that. And you also see my students working to skirt a trailer uh, on Pine Ridge uh, in honor of Gladys and uh, cooperation amongst each other. So those are the two I'm going to focus on. Also, you see this here because Occam was a teacher and he was one to first teach the alphabet using chips like that uh, as well to teach. So I start with that. And um, it's it to me is a very critical uh, place. And and you look at the scent, look when he was born. Take a take a look at that. I mean, if you if you know your history, right? Okay, what was, you know, and think about the United States. Remember, and I say this with love, <laughs> that unless you're Native American, your ancestors have Native, unless you have Native American roots and ancestry and lineage or African American or other people that may have been enslaved, all people to this nation are immigrants, okay? African American were, was a forced type of forced Okay, and Native Americans, we were here. So we should be able to understand that this is a nation of immigrants. And that's not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that's who we are, right? And so look at the time he lived in, in the United States was not even a country politically yet, was it? Okay, at the time of his birth. So that's why I like to start with him because look at who he was. So now I'm going to tell you, Mayor, I'm going to go through some of these fast, okay, just to elicit responses or maybe questions or just plant a seed on Occam and who he is. But he is definitely an inspiration to me. And he was a Christianized Indian, and we'll find out why. Look at this. Take a look. Born in a wigwam. That's a quote directly from him. I'll let you read it. Scan it. unacquainted with the English ton. All right, this to me is critical. And I ask a question at the bottom for us to think about what motivated him. I'm gonna let you scan through that folks and see if there's one that might stand out to you. Does this just go away? Does this, does one's history, does this impact me today? There's traumatic history, history of trauma, cultural trauma, historical trauma exists in communities of color, in native communities, especially native communities that are were forced onto reservations there you know we have a reservation here and there's a unique story with our reservation but if you look at other reservations throughout the the, the historical trauma clearly lives on Occam inspired me to try to do better learning about him so I leave that up there just for a moment. Why is this important? Because it doesn't disappear from a community. Well, that was in, that was in, that was it. But it lives on opportunities lost. The opportunity costs of this are the opportunities lost and those are passed on. I am grateful that I have had a chance to, to become educated and to move forward with this. So that's why I leave that up there. Why is this important? How does that impact him? Okay, very, very important. 
So I'm going to move on. I did not want to read it to you, but I think you can read that. And I think we can come back and ask that question. So people ask Indian conversions. You go to any reservation, go to any reservation. And I, I can't say I'm 100% sure, but I can tell you that I'm 99.999% sure that if you go to a Native American reservation, you will find a church on it, a Christian church. It doesn't matter what branch of Christianity it can be a Catholic church, it can be a Presbyterian church, it can be an Episcopalian church, it can be a congregational church, as long as it's a Christian church, because the First Amendment did not apply to Native American Indians. This was Christianization was a goal, okay, was uh, of colonization, okay, there is no doubt, okay, and, but Samson Occam's mother worked as a servant in the home of someone in Connecticut, and she's, you saw how he lived. So was this a way out? Was this a way up? So she's going to send her son to a boarding school in the 1700s. And that's the same kind of thing that happened in the 18 and 1900s in this country. Okay. All right. Remember, this is colonial Connecticut, not the United States. That will happen in this country when Native Americans are forced, forced to go to boarding schools virtually and learn English and and assimilate, forced assimilation. Um, not that they didn't want to, but what a, a certain question might be, can I learn English with my long hair? Can't I learn about the white man without having to cut my hair or change my clothes or change my name from who I am to a different name? So those questions were asked. So that's why he would go to right here, right up the road from Eastern, right up the road from Wyndham Willimantic is Columbia. Okay, and this is where he went to school in 1743 to prepare him to be, to learn. And he felt that that was the way that if he could teach his children and get them out, you saw his life out of a life of destitution. And the, the last one I always bring up as being very interesting. They wanted to prepare him to be a useful teacher among his brethren. We will see. He moves on. This is, a, I, I actually have like 30 slides on Occam. I, I just condensed to a couple things. Okay. But he was a teacher. He found a way. Christianity allowed him to um, perhaps, well, he hoped it would be looked at or viewed in a different way. The sad thing is, I will say, I believe that, and please, I hope no one takes offense to this. I am not trying to be offensive in any way. I think in the long run that Occam was not only betrayed by Wheelock and the uh, English that tried to teach him, but by Christianity in and of itself, because when all was said and done, Occam was a uh, Christian Indian, didn't matter, he was Indian. He was, and that's what they were called. That's, you know, if you want to ask me why I use the word Indian, that's how he was referred to and how he referred to himself. But, you know, it's funny how other people feel they can tell you what you can be called, you know. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to say Native American? You know, we, we can ask about that. So, so um, you know, he decided that uh, he wanted to help others and they sent him off to England. Maybe you didn't know this, to raise funds. He was so successful. He was a hit in England, believe it or not, Samson Occam. He did make many missions to Oneida. I could spend years on this. He received lots of money. Look at the money he received, King George III and the Earl of Dartmouth. That's an important name. Okay. Take a look at what I have put in bold. He felt that, he really felt that, and he wrote of that. He felt good that he could raise money for the good of Indian people, only to find that he would be betrayed. His wife refused, his wife refused to wear English clothing or speak English. He wore the English clothing to speak English. I always wonder, I wonder what it was like to live in that house for her to make that point, okay? But he, he raised the money to start an Indian school and his teacher, Eliezer Wheelock, 
decided he was going to move the school to New Hampshire, okay, out of Columbia and to New Hampshire uh, and make that school to teach white missionaries rather than teach native people. This is a long story short. And um, I put that map because the Western Indians at this time, okay, would be the native, think about colonial America. This is pre, you know, pre history. This predates the United States, right? Okay. So if you look at my cursor, Dartmouth right here, right? And Hanover here, okay, in this area was more to the Western Indians, which would be the New York tribes, the Haudenosaunee, the, the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, all of those. And so wanting to make missions. And, and hey, Akam himself went to Oneida as well, okay, and was welcome in Oneida. There's again long stories of, of that, but uh, and what what upset him most was not that they he he was upset they were going to move it and it wasn't going to be in Connecticut, okay, in his 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 homelands. But what what was most hit, dis, discouraging was that Native Indians would not be trade. So he felt that beyond. So when I look at that, I will tell you what's the relationship of. Uh, Mohegan and Dartmouth, it is obviously we have healed and we have done a lot. Yes, last year, two years ago, no, yeah, two years ago, Dartmouth celebrated their 250th year. And I was able to be a guest speaker right there in Columbia with Dartmouth, with, with their native studies programs. They have, they have tried to turn that page and live up to that, live up to a different legacy. Okay. And so I was honored to do that, uh, with, with the school in Columbia as well. And so when I look at the legacy, what, wow, right? The perseverance, okay? His, his willingness to teach, but he, he learned, uh, he went to Oneida and he learned, he tried to start his own uh, Christian Indian community uh, called Brotherton, uh, again, was very difficult and he died there. And that's why I showed that picture where you can't even get to his grave. There's a sign there and a, a man has this, this farmer, this white farmer has a post that says, do not cross into this land, call this number. And I'm like, okay, I'm with my spouse and I'm there, we're going to see that. We're going to see Occam. We are not, you know, can't do that. You know, I'm there, yes, I can. We're gonna call, and then I'm looking, I'm there, oh my goodness. We can't, first of all, the fencing and the there's a little brook and we're never going to find it, right? Okay, so I called and I said who I was. And let me tell you, he was the best. He was like a steward. He did not want people going there. He took me out there, his man in his 80s to Occam's grave. So I could be there. I would not take photographs. We don't, I'm not gonna, I wouldn't do that. To do a ceremony there, to see where he was buried. He was an 80 something year old man. And he said, we're crossing over this, going down the gully, going to cross over the river. And he said, I can carry you across. I'm there, uh, no, I don't think so. It's okay, I can walk across that, you know? And and so I say, that we are on that medicine wheel together. We are on that medicine wheel together. So that is Occam. If you had questions before we looked at Gladys Tantaquitian, who I might spend a little bit more time. Um, I, you, you know, you're so inspirational. It's hard to put, uh, you know, uh, put any kind of, um, you know, stops in this. So I just do have to say there's eight minutes left. Oh, you're kidding. For this, no, for this schedule, for this schedule meeting. Now, I just want to let everyone know that um, I did ask Beth earlier um, if she'd be willing to stay a little bit longer, but I know, especially if there's some students or something that um, have to leave at three o'clock. Um, but if you want to stay, we can, um, I think Yulia also said, it's okay for us to stay uh, I'm on this call a little bit if longer. You want, if people um, want it. But if you, um, Maybe can because uh, I do want to just uh, field some questions maybe that some students or others might be interested in. So if you could um, just uh, give, I know it's hard because well, she's so illustrious, but maybe a, a, just a minute or two on her and then we're yes, going to take some questions. See. Okay. I think this is probably, I have summed up from her great niece, our medicine woman, uh, Melissa Tantaquisian Zobel, who wrote a really fine book on her called Medicine Trail, the life. 
Medicine Trail, The Life and Lessons of Gladys Tentaquidgen. And she had a thank you letter at the end that I condensed. And I thought that was the perfect way to say that. So this is what she said thank you for to Gladys. And this was the perfect way to, to, as you look at that, facilitating the end of that, fostering economic development. Yes, our traditional remedies never, ever take the last of any plant. Never, ever take the last of any plant. Fighting to save our traditional ceremonies. Absolutely, our naming ceremonies, our smudging ceremonies, our sweat lodge ceremonies, the Sundance ceremony out west where she helped Lakota try to do that. Preserving the, the meaning of our ancient symbols. This is one of them, the life trail. It represents our New England hills, doesn't it? But isn't that life, the ups and downs? And isn't the life this, a cycle of moons and suns and circles, the crescents there you see? Oops, the crescents, the moons and the suns and the dots are the people we meet along the way. To do that, passing on our stories, I could tell wonderful stories. Founding the, finding the oldest Indian owned museum in the country right here. You may come here when it reopens after COVID, free of charge three rooms, okay, providing community education, fighting for the civil rights of all, going and bringing people of color from the front, back of the bus to the front saying, no, she did that. She was forced to the front of the bus. She went bringing social justice to prisons where she taught to women that were in prison, noting that these are, are women who, for whatever reason, something bad happened in their life. They're not bad people necessarily and teaching them that, bringing that social distance, uh, that social justice, excuse me, to preserve our environment. And, th and this to me is what I took when I went to Pine Ridge. Thank you most of all. Thank you most of all for the intangibles of your good medicine by constantly reminding the world of all that the Mohegans have been all that we have been. You inspire your people to complete the circle and fulfill their destiny. She did. I had to travel to Pine Ridge as she did for my own personal reasons, but it was also a wonderful opportunity to take students with me and a couple other Mohegans, my sister and another one of our ceremonial people to come with me in search of our own deeper pathways. That is the museum that she and her family, her brother and father built with their own hands. And um, I'm going to go back as we go to questions because I have another symbol. I'm going to the first one that has our symbol. If that we took an old symbol from our baskets and created a modern day flag and symbol, if anyone has questions on that. We have the circle of life, the life force, uh, the women, our matrilineal matri matriarchal history, the 13 dots around that, that represent the 13 moons on turtles back because of our life. We went in lunar years, the 13 segments and the 13 generations since Uncas, the four directions that are shaped like our wigwams or the turtle, the four directions that teach us a new day in the East and patience and compassion in the South, healing in the Western direction of the black direction, spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional, and the wisdom of the white direction to the North, the knowledge, red, is in the east, yellow in the south, and the tree of life, our ancestors, the roots, we, the tree that grows and the branches to our youth. So I, I really do say thank you, Katoptom Tamash, to my ancestors. And I will stop the share at this time. Oh, you're muted. That's, uh, that's um, very, very inspiring way to end that segment. I know there's a lot more, um, Beth. I do. There are a few people who um, have to go because they have class or teaching. Of course. Before. So I'm going to just try to um, field a couple of these uh, questions. There's there's a number of questions, but um, there is one from Yulia. But Yulia, if you don't mind, I'm going to wait um, because yes. we can stay a little bit longer and we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, from uh, Dr. Liu, from Barbara Liu, it says, um, she read a really good article about Occam's hymns with her class. They just see that. I can see her question. Yeah. The hymns are fabulous. They're so so amazing in his sermons. So good for you. I love. I can I take her class too. She's doing all that. <laughs> I think I think she's still with us. 
Um, they're from a, a, a couple of um, students, from Sophia and also Anthony. They both live in Uckham Hall. Yeah. They yeah. love hearing about the history. So thank you uh, very much. A couple of people saying they um, can, they have to go, but that they could listen and talk to you for hours. Um, no, Barbara, know, she yes. can sign me. You can doctor it to whatever she wants. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, one, I think that you had mentioned this, one of the things about um, Gladys was, and I think you mentioned, she was also a librarian at the Niantic Women's Prison. Yes, she taught at the Niantic Women's Prison. She really did. Yeah. And, and she taught reading. Okay. Mm -hmm. And where I had, what was a quote? I look if I have a quote for her on that. Um, well, she gave inspiration to the, those women that had very little hope, but she taught reading. And I remember a story that Melissa uh, told me that Gladys took her with her and, and didn't think twice of taking her to the prison to meet these women so mm -hmm. she could learn with them uh, mm -hmm. and all. So, and this is a little girl of seven years old, okay? Eight years old, never thought twice, never thought twice, correct. Yeah, um, so you you know raised so many, and thank you for um, describing the meaning behind the symbols. You know, I was, um, you know, th just thinking about throughout the years all of these you know quotes that I've heard about the, like the um, the Sankofa symbol in the Twi language about going back and getting learning from the past to ensure a, a strong future. And I think you know just thinking about how all of this um, ties together. Um, Mary, my, how do you say that? You, in order to move forward, you must go back. Mm -hmm. And I think, why can't, why can't our nation see that? Why do they, what is this? And this is my, please, no offense. This is my opinion only. I'm not speaking for anyone, but why can't our nation learn that acknowledging and is not, you know, it's okay to acknowledge this past. It's part of who we are, but it's like, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't kill any Indians. My old woman, you know, we didn't enslave it. Well, no, but there's traumatic history. It doesn't disappear. And it's it's okay to do that. Well, I'm not asking you to apologize for the sins of, you know, the sins of the father and mothers. To, I'm, I'm saying acknowledgement and without atonement and apology without atonement is just shallow and hollow. And I just feel strongly. I don't understand. And that's just me. And I and and people can challenge me on that. I understand that but mm -hmm. I don't know why. I don't know why you have to go back in order to move forward. You know what, I'm gonna, I, I know I'm probably gonna go over, but I'm gonna say this. I try to, when I was teaching, I used to say, think of nations and human, of a group of humans. We're just a group of people, right? Well, you as a human being, can you grow without looking at, you know, you know, your past? Sometimes I have to look at my mother. I have to look at my father's. I have to look at my history. And in order for me to do that, I have to go back and face those. Sometimes they're not, sometimes painful memories. And when we do look at those painful memories, it allows us to grow and become stronger and better. We need to do that as a nation. Yes, or, or, or not, we will be unable to move forward. Or <laughs> as educators, or as educators, we can. Yes. Um, so there is a, um, I'm going to uh, share a question from Yulia here. She's interested in hearing more about your perspective about the marginalization yes, of very similar. Uh, indigenous I persons. I saw the question. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yes, we look at the uh, Inuit people and, and I'm trying to remember, I, forgive my lack of memory on some of the tribe affiliations and the fact that oil reserve we look at the oil reserves and and the killing and the desecration of the tundra and the reindeer populations and the people that survived on that and how they were forced to move north or more northerly and more northerly the indigenous people of the soviet empire so people could have you know dig up the tundra and the lichens they lived off of so unfortunately these uh, people that have that followed their food sources also are so much more marginalized and and hard to survive and we're talking about today we're not talking about 100 years ago so yes i used to try to do that a little bit and look at the similarities of westward movement with eastern movement in the soviet empire so i hope i, I tried to do it but the best that i could thank you that's a wonderful question mm -hmm. Uh, Alicia has a question. Um, how do you feel about and address those that are looking to erase parts of our past from history? 
um, especially recently with the tearing down of statues. I fight it, I fight it <laughs> every day. Okay. I, oops, I used that word fight, right? Okay, sorry, right? Okay. Um, I, I, I try to counter that every day. Um, I, I do, I do. I teach, I try to teach why it's okay to, that, that people, you know, history is a perspective. It is written by the victors. It is written through a different eye. And if by recognizing that we're not changing history, we're, we're telling it, we're not changing what happened, we're telling what happened. And so it is a constant battle. Um, I will tell you that my work with educators, I am inspired by the, some of the, the educators that we have that are fabulous, that they, they just feel the need for the help, help. We need help, we need resources, we need our, our knowledge as well. But I, I fight it, I, I'm, I'll be the first one to be there saying, you know, I, whether it be a statue that you should put in a museum. Okay, I, speaking of Russia, going to Moscow and looking at that world war they have a, a, a museum right in downtown Moscow on, Moscow on World War II. And that's where the statues of the Nazis and of the Soviets were. Well, the Soviet, they have all their own problem with some of the statues in the Soviet history, but put it in there, tell the story. Mm -hmm. That's my, that's my, that's my, my view. Only mine. I don't speak for everyone on the elders. I don't speak for every native. I don't speak for every people on Mohegan, but mm -hmm. I do speak for me. Thank you. Um, Virginia, did you have a question? I see some, uh, you'll have to unmute, unmute the microphone. Uh, Virginia, you are yeah. muted. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to know, it, the, our country seems to uh, be making an effort, uh, you know, it politically and even in our local states and schools to, uh, to see our era and improve our attitude about everything and treat everybody equally. Do you see any progress on your end of that score um, as a teacher? Uh, of equity in school? Yes, uh, equity in general across the board. Um, yes and no. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, a lot of the, the educators that I have, I, I have the joy to work with. The Mohegan Tribe is a, I have to give a shout out to the Mohegan Tribe. We, we're a major sponsor of the Teacher of the Year program where we do professional development. We have a grant program that teachers can apply for where we do inreaches and outreaches with educators. And I must say that I have seen the educators that I've been able to work with are exemplary, wanting to do it. I think they feel their hands are tied again, that we need to provide quality resources, quality resources made by people that are native educators or people that understand we have. A, so I do see a lot of progress. At the same time, I told you that story of the students walking in with headbands and, right. and the cultural appropriation issue with that and, and having to do that. But I would say that generally, yes, but it depends on where you go. We, we here, I have found in Connecticut are, are a little bit more um, open sometimes, but not always. It depends on where you go. Mm -hmm. So I know that's not, I don't know if that's what you're looking for. No, I, I agree. We have a long way to go, I think. Hmm. Ah, yeah. Alicia. Yes, that's very interesting about our symbols. We do try to do that. You know, and I always try to talk about, I was BC before casino when I grew up. So I always had to do it the old way. You know, I'm grateful. Let me tell you, uh, you know, if the, this is going to sound awkward, if the casino had to close down forever, and I understand it was difficult right now with, you know, COVID and entertainment business. Thank you for, thank you for working. Thank you for being a part of the Mohegan team and the spirit of a quay, Alicia. Thank you so much. I know she knows what I'm talking about. And um, I will say that, uh, uh, it would not change who I am. I, it will, will never change who I am. Uh, does it provide for health care? I am grateful that I have a health care plan that, that my tribe is able to provide that for me. I am grateful that our children can get an education. I did it the old fashioned way, BC, before casino went into debt. I'm, I was okay with that and paid it off. I was lucky I went, to, I went to a school that didn't cost me as much and I, financial aid being a poor Indian Irish kid that I could um, get financial aid and, and good thing the Eastern basketball coach saw me play basketball too. So that 
Um, at least, oh, okay. Uh, so if there, if there are no more questions, if someone wants to, um, please feel free to yeah. um, have some final thoughts. But Absolutely. I, you know, I just want to say this is such an inspiring and um, informative and interesting. It just opens up the door to so many other issues about, you know, yeah, they um, happy to do any follow up with any of the any professors, Virginia, I don't know who it was that said or I know it was a dot heard what was her name, uh, who, who had the films and stuff. I'm happy to come to her, do a Zoom with her class if she wants anything. I'm, I love this. This, this is, um, it inspires me. It really does. Oh, Dr. Barbara Lou, thank you. I'm happy to. You asked about that. Yes, I would love to anytime. Uh, my email, I will put my email in the message box. How's that? In the chat box. Okay, yes. Um, there's a message from someone. Um, Go ahead, ask. Uh, they they want to know how to contact you. Yep, there it is. Mm -hmm. Regan at mohegan.mail.com. Mm -hmm. Happy to. Okay. And I'm so, happy to follow up with anything. The symbols, the, the culture, our ceremonies, walking in two worlds, the world of, of na natives having to be Christianized and then trying to get our old ceremonies back. That's a whole hour in and of itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or more. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, Beth. Um, I and you know, want to just uh, really, I'm so grateful you were able to do this and made time for this. And thank you everyone who was able to join uh, in this discussion today. It's really been interesting. And, um, you know, the beginning of a continued dialogue and discussion. You, I can, I can see that. For your, yeah. Your um, to yeah. Yes. Beth, uh, we'll be in touch by okay. email with a long Julia, time. thank you for your question. I, I have to tell you, and I'll finish with this for you, Julia. Sometimes my students would say, so it's like asking which child you like best, right? So do you like teaching Russian history better than you like teaching Native American studies? And I say, you know which one I love the most? The one that I'm teaching at that time. <laughs> so uh, it was very interesting. Yeah, so I have a, a longer question and kind of follow up on your um, um, description of uh, Native Americans in, in Russia or post-Soviet Russia. Oh. Of, course, of course, I know that they've been marginalized, but um, I am involved in a project of decolonization mm. uh, or looking back and trying to um, you know, recapture, relearn my history. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would like to talk to you about and how I can connect uh, my current um, American uh, context and with, um, with my post-Soviet upbringing and put it under the umbrella of decolonization. Oh, that's fabulous. And I will say, I didn't have a, so you can appreciate this how do you teach Russian history in one class, right? Okay, so I clearly had to, I would start with, you know, uh, Ukrainian, Kiev, you know, Kievian Rus first, you know, and try to go, and so you have to pick, so I would do thematically at times. I mean, mm -hmm. through the princes, through the Tsars, through the, so you know, what gets even worse in the, so in the Soviets and then modern, it was just, it was difficult, but mo most enjoyable. No. Thank you, thank you. I've been there three times. I've been to Russia three times. I loved it. Um, we should go all together once. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Like, <laughs> my tour guide? If I go, would you be my tour guide? Yes. Oh. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll decolonize. Uh, all right, we'll decolonize together. Right. We'll put that cash on hand in case we have to pay someone off. That's all. That's right. Yes. <laughs> all so right. thank you. I'm just going to ask. Um, I just want to ask Yulia and um, Beth if you would just stay for a minute. I just there's something sure. I want to ask you about uh, the recording and just some of the nuts mm -hmm. and bolts of this. But I really appreciate everyone for well, coming and all of your questions and, <laughs> yeah, and your participation. It really made for a very rich discussion. So thank Top you. Tom to Maosh. I, it, the, trust me, the honor was mine. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye.